Good morning, church. It's Sunday morning here and a sunny one. I hope things are going well for you guys way over there. Today is Unity Sunday. This is um, an annual event, so far as I know, that I've just recently learned about, where ministers from the Churches of Christ from all over the place uh, take a Sunday to think about unity, being together and what it means to be the one body of Christ. And particularly amongst the Churches of Christ, this is a time for, um, especially in a year like this, white congregations and black congregations to think about what it means to be the one body of Christ, a plea, a very Church of Christ plea for unity. And so we want to take up the theme of Unity Sunday, and this year we have been asked to focus on a very simple prayer for um, the center of our reflection. That prayer is very simply this. Um, it's one line, and perhaps we should just pray it first. If you'll pray with me, this is the theme for Unity Sunday 2020. Lord God, increase our faith. We ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. Increase our faith. Some time ago, um, many moons ago now actually, Randy Harris told a story when we were at the Abilene Lectures once about, not so much a story, but offered a reflection on the nature of the impossible. Um, particularly in church, it seems like we are fond of saying that certain things are impossible, that certain problems are insurmountable, that certain issues are beyond the scope or the grasp or the capacity of the church to address those things. And so we use the language of impossibility. Um, boy, there is this addiction problem in our community and it would be great if we could do something about that, but we're just a small church, or we have a limited budget, or we don't have whatever resources we think we need to have, and therefore it is impossible for us to do that. Boy, there is a poverty point. Oh, I can't talk, I haven't had enough caffeine yet today, guys. There is a poverty problem in our community and it would be great if we could do something about it, but it's just impossible for us to do anything about it. Boy, I can see that we have deep racial divides in our community and even within the church. But the issues that face us as we address those things are insurmountable and it's impossible for us to make any headway. Indeed, even over the last um, few months, as the country and the church has been focused on the racial divides and the tensions and the injustices and the challenges that we have long faced and continue to face and will face for some time to come, I have heard that language oftentimes used in discussions of ministers and church leaders and Christians of all sorts. We would love to do something about racial injustice. We would love to do something about all of the problems that we face here, but it's just impossible. And so taking up this penchant for declaring things impossible, Randy, all these years ago, pointed out that most of the time we don't use the term impossible correctly. We don't mean that it is physically or by the laws of nature impossible for us to do such a thing. He doesn't mean that it would violate all of the rules of existence. We don't, we don't mean that it would violate all of the rules of existence for us to do a thing. Most often when we say something is impossible, it would be impossible for us to do something about addiction or poverty or racial tension or bad marriages or whatever the issue that is before us means is that we're really just not willing to do what it would take. And sometimes that's understandable. Sometimes it is reasonable to say, oh, it is impossible. And by that, I mean, we're not willing to make the sacrifices necessary to address this or that problem. 
But there are also times where looking at the gospel that Jesus brought and the life that Jesus embodied and the world that Jesus is calling us to and the kingdom that God is making as he restores and reconciles things to look at a problem and then say it is impossible and by that mean that I'm just not willing to make the sacrifices the changes or the demands necessary to address this problem, that amounts to a lack of faith. That amounts to me not being able to wrap my mind around understanding that God can take care of things that are impossible. And indeed in Scripture, one of the things we see about God, one of the things that I I love about God, we see this often in the Old Testament, we see this, of course, in the New Testament, is that God is the God who delights in, who revels in, who indulges in moving past all of the possibilities that we hold as ironclad, and he does the impossible. This is Abraham and Sarah trying everything within their power to have a child to fulfill the promise of God. Um going through all of the possibilities. The only way Abraham would say that this could work is if you give the inheritance to my right-hand man, Eliezer. And God said, we're not going to do it that way. That's a possibility, but that's not how it's going to work. Sarah's saying, well, if that's not the way it's going to work, the only thing left that is possible is for you to impregnate my maiden, Hagar. And God said, that certainly is a possibility, but we're not going to do it that way. And when they had marched through all of the possibilities, God then takes up one of the impossibilities. Sarai in her 90s, Abraham and 100, always barren, never able to have children, would bear the child themselves. He is the God who does impossibilities. Um, The same thing is true as we go through Scripture from beginning to beginning to end culminating we might add in Jesus and the kingdom as Jesus goes up against the power of darkness and the world and death and how things work and how things are with nothing but divine love laying down his considerable power and subjecting himself to the cross trusting God to be able to do the impossible It is to heal the world, to make things right, to vindicate the way of his people, restore and reconcile all things through love. And of course, the God who does the impossible with love brings us closer to our point today. Because oftentimes when we face the problems that we face as regards racial reconciliation, racial justice, and Um, division within our churches, we oftentimes demonstrate our lack of faith most clearly in our belief that the simple yet complex, profound act of loving one another in real and tangible and individual and social economic ways will not suffice. We need something more than the way that Jesus brought into the world. And so in the face of such problems and in the face of such reactions where we say it is impossible, love will never work. Jesus just doesn't understand our world. He doesn't know what we're up against. We stop today. We pause today to pray. Lord, increase our faith. Because perhaps maybe what we need is not more votes or more money or more power to demand that our will be done no matter how good or righteous that will is but maybe what we need is more faith that says God can do this if only we will trust him and love one another in ways that are real and deep and tangible Uh, perhaps our congregations can be United, if we are willing to give up the things that we are unable to, uh, unable to even imagine giving up. The songs we sing or 
the way we sing them or the way our preacher preaches for the sake of the way somebody else sings or the song they sing or the way their preacher preaches. It just wouldn't be church anymore if we didn't have things that way. It would be impossible. The problems are insurmountable, but I would wager that the God who can bring life to Isaac through Abraham and Sarah, that the God who can defeat death through the cross and the resurrection can work a miracle in us if only we would trust. And so as I think about this impossibility, a second prayer came to mind. This text has been a favorite of mine. I've made no secret that the last several years of my life have been exceedingly hard for me and my family in many ways, although they have been exceedingly rich in others. And this prayer has come to me many times over these last few years as I've struggled to understand God and the world around me as the ways that I thought things worked have come crumbling down around and I've had to learn to relearn some of those things. And this, this text is in Mark uh, chapter 9. And starting in verse 14, let me just read this to you. And then let me introduce you to this prayer. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. And when the whole crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe and they ran forward to greet him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak, and whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid, and I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do it. And you can hear the desperation in the Father's voice, right? This seemingly impossible, this seemingly insurmountable problem, he's exhausted all of the possibilities. He's heard even the rumors about this miracle worker, this Jesus and his disciples who have been doing great things. And so he goes to them in hope and the disciples gather around to cast out this demon as they have with others to bring healing as they've had done with others, to bring joy as they've done with others, to restore humanity and dignity as they've done with others. And they can't do it. They fail at doing it. And you hear the desperation, right? It's impossible. Ask your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. So he answered them, You faithless generation, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, he immediately, or saw him immediately, it convulsed the boy and he fell to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth and Jesus asked the father how long has this been happening to him and he said from childhood and has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him but if you were able to do anything have pity on us and help us and Jesus said to him if you are able all things can be done for the one who believes and immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw what a cra that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse so that most of them said he is dead but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he was able to stand I believe help my unbelief the challenge that most of us face is not a challenge of not believing of just casting off the promises of God of saying callously and coldly in a calculated way oh that will never work the challenge most of us face is that we are so bombarded by the way the world is um, supposedly working how things are supposed to work in the real world that our imaginations have not been sufficiently trained to allow for the possibility of God doing something bigger than what we think is possible. 
And so in times like these, when we face injustice on every hand, when the problems are deep and generational and thorny and sticky and painful and dangerous, it's not a time to say this is impossible because God has placed the church in the world to bring those walls of division down, whether those walls be economic divisions or political divisions or generational divisions or racial divisions. We are the people who tear walls down. It is no time to say it is impossible because to look at the racial challenges facing our country today and say it is impossible is to abdicate what it means to be the church Rather, perhaps it is time to say, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. And lean into the God who does the impossible. Who does what we could never do under our own steam. Who accomplishes what we could never accomplish with our own power. I want to pray for you and then I'm going to ask you to pray with me. And uh, then we'll remember who we are as we go out into the world. I want to ask you to go out this week with particular emphasis on the notion, the truth, the bedrock, that God does the impossible and that he can work those impossibilities in the problems in our communities that are may way bigger than we are. But look, to put it simply, if God can cast that demon out of that little boy, he's got the power to work with us too. I believe, help me in my unbelief. Let's pray. Lord, increase our faith. Lord, help our unbelief, even in the midst of our belief. Expand the horizons of what we think is possible. Show us a clearer picture of you. Help us to lean into you. To know your heart for restoration and reconciliation in this world. To act fearlessly and bravely and faithfully as agents of that restoration and reconciliation. Father, we know that we will make missteps as we do that. Please be gracious and help us to be gracious. Help us to have humble and penitent hearts, have a passion for the world you are creating through the power of your Spirit and the kingdom of your Son. And now we pray to you as a family. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. I don't have my Bible with me this morning with a little thing stuck in it with our scripture reading on it. So let me look this one up real quick. John, 1 John 4. It's the one I always mess up. Having said that, I'll mess up the Matthew text. <laughs> All right. Let's remember who we are as we go out into the world. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Have a great week, church.